stars of animation are shining. It's time to stay tuned. And now, here's your host, Phil Mackey. Good evening, everyone, and thank you once again for letting me be your guide to all things animated. Tonight's special guest is Mona Marshall. Her acting career has spanned multiple studios and genres, from recurring roles on Comedy Central's South Park to feature presentations like Disney's Frozen and the Monsters Incorporated films from Pixar. With more than 15 years experience voicing characters for animation, Mona has recently been focusing on her own original webcomic, Adventures of Puss and Dick. This relationship-inspired project is even heading towards its own animated interpretation. Mona's website also hosts Voices for Fun, a video series that teaches vital techniques applicable to any situation. With tons of personality and more voices than you can shake a stick at, Mona Marshall is on her way in just a few moments. But first, this. I'm going down to South Park, gonna have myself a time. Friendly faces everywhere, humble folks without temptation. I'm going down to South Park, gonna leave my woes behind. And we're parking day or night, people spouting how to never. Mona Marshall, welcome to Stay Tuned. Oh my God, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're, so, we're all so bubbly. I, you know, I can tell a fellow theater person a mile away, so. Oh, yeah. So your background is in theater too. Oh yeah, musical theater, all that oh stuff. Oh my God, yes. Yes. I love yep. you already. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that, that and um, speech and debate and just. Oh good. Uh, See, I didn't do that much in debate, but I well, love. Me neither. It. The speech part. It was. It was yeah. more. Uh, the speech part of speech and debate was really like doing a one man show. Yeah. Where you look like you're uh, schizophrenic and you're just doing all the different characters. <laughs> Wait. I wrote a one-woman musical, by the way, called Did Life you? is a Celebration, Potholes and All. Oh, I love it. Performed it probably before you were born, in the early 90s. <laughs> no, I was born in 81. Oh, my God. You don't look like you were born in 81. I just had a, my birthday yesterday. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. I made it another year. I cheated death one more year. Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> That's the oh, goal, right? Just one more yes. year. <laughs> yes, one more year. One more year. So I wanted to wanted to get started by bringing up how you were originally planning on being an English professor. <laughs> and uh, how you did know, you know that? Well, I, I dig. I do my digging, and you know, I myself was at one point pursuing a path in science, like lab work and possible teaching. So I, I oh, feel, wow. feel like both of us kind of had some similar, you know, inklings, and then. And then we got redirected, right? Well, yes and no. Okay. They tell me that I was humming before I was talking. Oh. So I used to go downstairs. My childhood was not always the best, as many of ours is. My mom worked not 24-7, but close to. She was a hairdresser and worked really hard. My dad, who I now know was manic depressive, who knew back then, had trouble keeping a job. And there was lots of yelling. I had an older sister who just... <laughs> Uh, can you say oil and water? God bless her. Uh, she inherited my father's genes. I got my mother's autistic genes. That's artistic, not autistic. Um, <laughs> so I used to go downstairs and put on records of musical theater. Records. Records. Hey, I grew up with records yeah. too, Mona. I grew up with Tijuana Brass. Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I would dance and sing. Uh, but And my mother got me voice lessons, I think, when I was... Well, she died when I was 14, just to turn 14. So when I was 12, but her caveat was, this is to help you breathe better. I don't want you to go into theater. Oh. Well, you know, because all those stories, bad girl. So I went into college working on an English degree because I kind of pushed that down because I was trying to be pragmatic. And then I realized yeah. there's as much politicking in college as there is in anything else. You know, it's good to be able to recognize the silver linings of situations that maybe didn't seem like they were good at the time, right? Oh, absolutely. That's one major lesson. And way back when I was an English student, I had, you know, some really outstanding teachers. That's where my love of words came from. And how I learned about voice production mm. was I was going to go for a master's back at Central Missouri State. Okay. One of my English professors, my Shakespeare professor said, go to LACC 
they have an outstanding theater department. And that is where I learned about voice production, which is what I do when I do voices for fun. You know, it all tied together? Oh my God. You know, and the writing. I mean, I would not have the writing skills I have if it hadn't been for that. I love that you have a love of words because I also have a love of words. And people that know me personally know that I'm constantly uh, punning around much, <laughs> much to everyone's dismay. <laughs> oh, no, no. I love a good pun. Oh, good. Well, I love even a bad pun. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Enough punishment. <laughs> Oh, 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 she just, she went there. <laughs> so. I have to, you led me. I did, I did. You mentioned you were trained under the great Dawes Butler, uh, of course. What's one thing that you learned with him that has managed to somehow stay with you all of this time? Well, I th believe the first time I was in that class, he said, you know, if you can't act in a 30 second commercial, maybe you can't act. <laughs> well, there you go. Now, I realize this is not Shakespeare. I know that. Right. And I was trained doing classical theater. But I think what he was saying was, it's important to pick the essence of a character and then go with it. And then when you study improv, you learn to do that all the time. Like today, I'm doing a character that I haven't done for several years. You have to listen to it, find where that character is, and you just have lines. I mean, you have people kind of telling you what's going on, but you've got to think about what is going on and be there. Yeah. For, me, for me. I'm not saying voice people today necessarily do that, which I think they're missing out on, you know, a lot if they don't. Oh, that's, that's good. So be present is what you're saying. Be present. Exactly. Mm. And of course, when I studied theater, that's exactly. You must be present. You must listen. And even if you're not, you know, nowadays, even if you're doing original animation, most of the time you are not with the other people. I guessed it on a Disney show. Once again, I cannot mention uh, for children. <laughs> it's like, no, no, you can't say anything because it's not. A... And they were telling me that they don't do the, main, the ensemble together because they can't. And for me, one of the delights of doing Adventures of Puss and Dick when we recorded it was everybody was there, even though people didn't necessarily have the same scenes together. Because so you, you play off of each other. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's part of acting is reacting. Sure. Right? You betcha. Yeah. So you mentioned the, the Adventures of Puss and Dick. This is, yes. a, this is a passion project of yours or whatever the... It is a passion project. It's essentially really about communication. Okay. Um, and how masculine energy and feminine energy are different. Yeah. And... It's okay. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. However, however... Part of what needs to happen, I believe, is in order to understand each other better, it's a good idea to step into somebody else's shoes. Mm. And one of the reasons I've been driven to do this is there is so much vitriolic language today. Whether you're talking about countries that are in conflict or to political groups that are in conflict, part of it is if we do not begin to understand each other and see where we can make compromise, we're going to end ourselves. And so since I can't, you know, I'm not a politician. I'm not, oh, I can wave my wand and change everything. I thought, I mean, this came out of years and years of development. This didn't, I mean, this goes back to kind of an epiphanal experience. But, I the, had timing, but the timing is interesting because we're in Why such a, a volatile, yes. uh, sexually charged in a, a very angry way. Well, yeah. And if you look at yin and yang, yeah, you're talking about the fact that you need both to form balance. Right. And even in a, in a couple situation, even in a gay couple situation, even in a transsexual couple situation, you are still dealing with that balance of masculine energy and feminine energy. Yeah. So, and beyond that, you're also dealing with just balance, meaning we can't both be leading at the same time, right? right. There's that given right. somebody has to be taking the lead and someone is taking the back seat, but then those, those roles can be uh, interchangeable. And, exactly. Yeah. And that's why you said being present, yeah. that's as important in life, probably more important, you know, even that it is in theater to be present. Sure. And we're missing that because of the technology. Yeah. And I'm not saying, listen, technology is great, well, yeah. but we also need to encompass actually like one of the things I liked is that you wanted to see my face. Yeah. I wanted to see your face. It's very yeah. important. It's, it's so funny because when we are looking at what makes a good actor or actress, whatever you, what the proper term is anymore, uh, actor. <laughs> actor, when we're looking at someone who's good, we say they're good because they make us believe they're real. So oh, yeah. that's the whole point is being real with people. Uh, we suspend disbelief. Right. I mean... <laughs> that's it right there. Uh, so when you're, when you're creating a character, Mona... From scratch, okay? Let's not, you're picking up one from years ago. Yeah. Just, so before the voice is, is a solid voice that you can just turn on and off, where do you 
dock your mental boat? What do you hold on to in your mind in order to go, okay, now I know where to take this character? Well, first of all, I need to know who that character is. So whatever the writer or director can give me is important. And then as I know about that, for instance, if it's a shy, if it's a shy character, my voice is going to change. The placement is going to change. The rhythm is going to change. So that perfect example, uh, I did two ancillary characters today, never done before, both women, one in her 20s, who is a bit sarcastic. And, you know, that voice just got a little bit up in there and a little bit slight nasal quality to it because it can be a little bit in your face. And the other one had been through a lot of pain. She was older and there was a certain hesitancy. So it all comes from images I have in my brain. Mm. So first I see them outside, then I become them. And that's how I relate to whatever is going on. I love how you weave cadence into that too. Oh my God, yes. One of the things that Sue Blue used to say years ago, and she directed a couple of series I did. um, One of them was um, James Bond Jr. And she would say, don't pick up each other's rhythm because it's very easy to do that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. At some point in your career, did you find that you were picking up rhythms and had to kind of break yourself of that? Well, not so much. It wasn't like such a big thing, but, and usually I was the only woman, you know, and that that thing, I was basically, I think there were two women, not so much, but sure, of course. And you know, when you do anime, it's a whole different thing because you're going in with the rhythm of the mouth, but yeah, it's something you always need to be aware of. Sure. Well, speaking of anime, you were in the uh, English translation of one of my favorite Miyazaki films, Spirited Away. Oh, God, I love that film. Oh, my gosh, yes. In what ways, how is that experience different for you than any other anime you've done? Well, first of all, (laughs) the actual animation is so breathtakingly beautiful. Of course. Every time I see that dragon, I cry. Mm. First of all, I love dragons. This was a very interesting session. Mm. You know, a lot of people turn their nose down about 15, 20 years ago with anime, okay, and still did. When we did that session, half of us knew what anime was and appreciated it, and half of us was like, oh, yeah, it's that Japanese stuff. By the time we broke for lunch, their attitude had done a 180, and that was because of the magnificence of it, of the weight of it. Wow. And for me, I still think it's some of the most brilliant foley I've ever heard. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. I mean, everything was brilliant about the film. Sure. And the thing about Foley and scoring and also background looping Mm. is that when it's there, you don't know it's there. It just adds to the atmosphere and builds. Because I've done done live action. I've done animation. The only thing I haven't done is Foley. But I'm very aware of Foley because of those other two things. And when it's there and it works well, you don't notice it. It enhances things. When it's not good. Music is the same way. Yeah. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. Why do you suppose, because a lot of people prefer the subtitled version of anime to the English dubbing. What do you think about the Disney dubbed Miyazaki films? What is making them different? Well, I think part of it is the change. You know, once we started using Pro Tools, a lot of things changed. But one of the things I always respect about Jamie Simone is that for him, it was always about performance. So if you had a good performance, he would do everything in his power to make sure that the engineer got that to work. Now, that was a lot harder before Pro Tools. Oh, okay. So, and it's very interesting. I did a... So technology a, helps then. Technology. Oh, my God. Technology made all the difference in the world. Pro Tools meant that you could have a really good performance. And if it was just a little off... And now what's interesting is some anime, the dubbing is better than when the original animation has been shipped off to a foreign country and brought back here. And I am going to do everything in my power to make sure that Ventures of Puss and Dick is union and that it is done in the U.S. Bravo. It's not, not because people are not talented over there, but the subtlety. Yes. And my show is run on relationships, not on characters. You know, what you're saying is reminding me of something. And for years, I listened to these commentaries on different animated series. And it just kind of dumbfounded me that they would ship things off because it seems to me like when they do that, something gets lost. Oh, yeah. And then they have to ship it back again and have them reanimate a section because it wasn't done right. And I keep thinking, wouldn't it just been better to have done it here in the first place? Well, yeah, but the thing of it is, how much money do people need? I mean, this is systemic in our country. Yeah. And 
I understand now being a producer with this project because I, I've poured my own money and savings into this. I understand why a producer gets paid more. Absolutely. But there is no reason today that large companies especially are not union. There is not one reason, especially the dubbing contract, which is so cheap anyway. Mm, yeah. And the fact that people understand that to work on an animated film or a video game, Ugh. as soon as the project is over, they dissolve That's the crew every time. And it's it. kind of maddening to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, once again, I can make changes through what I do personally, the way I treat people, the way I pay people to the best of my ability. Ani has worked really hard and I've tried to pay her fairly based on, you know, the fact that it's coming out of my budget and there, we did do a little fundraiser and that helped, sure. but she has put in so much work. Same thing. I'm now looking for an animator and I need to have somebody who can work with me with the promise that if you believe in this project and you work on it, you will become part of what I'm pitching. Beautiful. I love same it. Same thing with Mark, same thing with the gal that did the background photography, Monica, and obviously with Ani, who's my character designer. I think that stuff matters, Mona. I think when Absolutely. you when you live by the truths you believe, it has the ability to transform people around you. Oh, absolutely. So my point is you can still make your money, but you don't have to do it on the backs of paying people cheaply. Absolutely. Uh, here's, here's a horrible segue. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. No, Did I answer your question about Miyazaki? Sorry, I started to go Miss Rocky. Yeah. I'm going, no, that's fashion. No. Uh, yeah, no, you did. You did. Of course, you've been a staple on South Park for years, right? So South Park, yes. Yeah. Do you break out ever into Sheila Broflovsky at random to people in your personal life? Does that oh, you mean like two hours ago when I was in the studio? <laughs> yes. That's oh, a... does your mother know what you... What, what, what does your mother know what you do? Oh, really? I don't think so. Could we talk the two, not too far from Joan Rivers? No, it's like, not too far from Joan Rivers. That's right. I, I totally believe that what makes people really, really good, because remember, I did not create that voice. Mary Kay did. But that is in my DNA. That courage has now become mine, just like it was hers. Because Mary Kay was part Jewish, too. I'm all Jewish. I mean, ethnically, I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> ethnically, I am Jewish. I was raised as a Reformed Jew as can be. But anyway, um, I do have a very strong spiritual belief. Sort of a pantheistic spirit, trees, rocks, all connected. Sure. My first thought when I hear pantheistic is that you're believing in the reverence of bread. <laughs> no. <laughs> and as in all. No, I know. And I'm I just know. being a goof. <laughs> okay. Where, where was I before we went on that segue? How, how you inherited the character and oh, she's now you. So, yes, but that's also very much my rhythm. I had been doing Joan Rivers at conventions and stuff back in the day because there's certain rhythms that are more natural. You know, it's like part of it is, I swear to God, there's an eight-year-old boy. I was a tomboy. There is an eight, there's an eight-year-old boy that lives inside of me and he's never going away. I like him. And from there, I have variations. I started doing, there's... There's Mark Elizabeth, and I am four and a half, and my older brother is Mikey. Yeah, okay, they get it, all right? You don't have to keep talking. I created an entire life for them. It's like you're having a whole conversation with yourself. Well, not to me. I'm having a conversation with them. It may sound like that to you, but to me, they're alive. And <laughs> Oh, yes. No, of course. Yeah, I no, just, no, no, no. I know. What I'm saying is that's not how I think about it. Right. And when I started doing them, that's where once I could get into the consciousness, because it's not just, oh, I can do a little boy voice or a little girl voice. It's you have to be there. Yeah. Like when I was doing Izzy, you know, that came from um, the placement. I had to be able to do a lot of exposition. So if you place sound forward, okay, forward in your mouth, if you can see what my teeth are doing. I do. It's slightly nasal, but also you can ch chop words quickly. Ah, look at all this technique. I love your technique. And it's something that you've worked into coaching as well. You've made coaching part of your life, right? Yeah. And that was Yasmin. She said, Mona, you should, two things she told me. Let's do a YouTube channel. What can you teach? <laughs> what can you do? I said, well, I know about voice production. And the thing I like about that is it's not like, oh, I want to be in voiceover, which is great if you really have a calling to be in voiceover or to be an actor. But I can teach people voice production that they can use no matter what they do because it's about using the voice, once again, communication effectively. Absolutely. That felt comfortable and that's free. My one-on-ones I charge, but what I'm giving people is a foundation 
that they can then use. And then you go take a class, you take an improv class. That's vital. And then they want to, if they want to focus, then they come to you and have one of those sessions and they get a more advanced degree of coaching. Yeah. But just if you want to know more about how to just use your voice in general, that $195 is worth it. Yes. In my opinion. The way you talk about it, it's very much like playing an instrument. Yes. Well, it is playing an instrument. Our voice isn't funny. Years of operatic training. Oh, opera. I studied opera. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Do you ever try to get back into the theater and do that stuff now? With the time I have, no. What I would like to do, if once I get Puss and Dick on the ground, then I have a children's read aloud book called Angel and the Magic Pen that I will work on next, that I developed as a volunteer at the local uh, school here, McKinley Elementary School, over a period of 15 years. It teaches articulation. It's imaginative. Anyway, what I would like to do is my one-woman show. Oh, again. great. Oh, uh, I love the lyrics. I it's love the music. It's so important to, to have that kind of love and passion for projects. I think it makes them feel authentic. I yes. I really do. Oh, honey, no one in their right mind would put this much passion in either the things I'm talking about. Or it sounds like the things that I can see in your background if you didn't have passion. Absolutely. And, you know, that's why I'm, I'm very vehement about this has to be union. It has to be where people are paid fairly. I mean, I'm not wealthy, but we're comfortable. We have decent cars. We own our, our own townhouse. I'm comfortable. And thank God I still do voiceover. I don't need to make a lot of money. I believe this project should be out on the world because A, it's really funny, and B, I think it can open people up. Well, you can tell a project where it comes from, I think, where the motivation comes from. It's, you can tell when it's, when it's finished that it uh, is like capturing lightning in a bottle, so to speak. That's very well put. Yeah, it's true. More with Mona Marshall after this. What's one piece of advice you would give to the child version of Mona if you had the opportunity? Oh, wow. Hmm. You know, I, I have fought with a feeling inadequate my whole life. And it seemed like everybody in Dawes' class was working before I was. And then I started working and then I never stopped. So I go back to this from dating Sal. I got divorced and met Sal in 1982. And I was a poor actor. I was touring with the LA Moving Van and Puppet Company. And that gave me, oh my God, a foundation in two things. One in theater, because we were working with children and children, that's a whole different thing. I never dreamed I would want to work with children. Dawes wrote the monologue that got me that job. I sang an original song I had written that got me that job. I knew nothing about hand puppets. That director, Paul Hansen, who was freaking brilliant, believed that it was easier to teach an actor to work a hand puppet than it was to teach a, a puppeteer to be an actor. Mm. That gave me a lot of confidence. And by the time I started doing voiceover, I used to say to myself, if you do not believe you are good enough to be here and earning this money, then you don't belong. Go away. What I would say to that little girl is these talents that you have were given to you. You do not own them. You are like a gardener, and this is your garden. Your job is to take that talent and develop it to the best of your ability and share it with the world in whatever way that comes to you. That's what I would tell that little girl. That's beautiful. Part of that is developing your inner life. Yes. And I'll be about work. My husband, God bless him, keeps me grounded. <laughs> That's not easy to do. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, <laughs> I wanted to bring up how you and I share a love of classic radio drama. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, the I shadow and all that stuff. <gasps> oh my God. I just love it. I love the shadow and, I, uh, and the acting. Oh my God. What you can learn about acting because in radio drama, just like in South Park, oddly enough, they don't, now they don't want your voices to be too out there. Mm. So much of it is by simple, slight placement, pacing, because it has to be real. Yes. We want it real, but we want it memorable. It's yes. a fine line between overacting and, oh. and just really having a character that you can sink your teeth into. Yeah. Oh, my God. I have an alter ego in the film world. Very few people know about him. He's a private detective in the 40s. And it's, it's a combination of, I'm, I'm forgetting his name right now, the guy that played in Get Smart. Yeah. Whose name yeah. I can't remember either. Yeah, but it's a combination of him and a little bit of Regis Philbin and just a whole- Oh, that's kind of- So what does he sound like? They call me Meadowdale, Peter Meadowdale. Oh, I like that. Thanks. Do that again, but do I, some more of that because there's something interesting about- It was a warm May afternoon on Friday the 13th, 1946. 
I was sitting in my office talking with Mona Marshall when a knock came at the door. I told her to come in. Oh, thanks. I like that. <laughs> Thank I like you. That. I like what you're doing with your tongue. There's something interesting that's it's happening. Not even, that's not yeah. even... Um, but I like that. Let me think I like it. that. It almost sounds as though you're, it's a foreign language and a slight speech impediment, and I like it. Oh. I like it a lot. You're very good at this. Thanks. I think you should consider doing this for a living. Oh, that's, that's very sweet. Thank you. Is there a particular character that you really felt personally connected to, but they didn't get a lot of screen time because the series didn't last very long? The character that broke my heart that they're not doing is Doraemon. Oh, that's weird. You know, the blue robotic cat. That's a Japanese icon. Did oh, you- okay, yes. Well, Disney, first of all, he's thought of with reverence and people love him. The Japanese and most Asian countries, they know him, they love him. He's as popular as Mickey Mouse. And Eric Sherman from Bang Zoom really worked with me on developing the character. He really wanted me to do it because I think he knew I could act it. And, you know, when you're doing something like that, I also did Chavo de la Ocho. If you speak to anybody who speaks Spanish or from Mexico, you say Chavo, they know who that is. Okay. A wonderful character started out live action. This man was like a, an iconic figure. He just died. He played this part of this eight or 10 year old boy for years and then it went into animation. And then Bob Buckholz got a hold of it here and I ended up doing Chavo. He was known for his cry. He was this little kid that lived in the, in the alley, basically. When you're doing an icon that belongs to different countries in a different language, for me, that allegiance to making it something that they're going to be proud of when it's translated is so important. Absolutely. And I love doing him. Once we locked into him, he was just wonderful because he was basically this. Oh, yeah. He was basically bipolar and he was always out there and he had this great little pocket. And he could pull out things like he had one thing where they were um, little prehistoric animals and they would come to life. And he had another where it was a door into all kinds of imaginary places that you could go in the future. Like a Felix the cat. Yeah. In a lot of ways, except Felix was never this you know, out there crazy. Yeah, well, but if he had his bag of tricks, right? I mean, it's... Exactly. Very but the premise was very interesting. The premise is that he, he is sent from the future where he is owned or friends with like the great, 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 great grandson of a little boy in the present, okay? Yeah. And he's sent back there because a the little boy in the present is, if he doesn't change his behavior... There's not going to be that future. So it's a cautionary tale then. Oh, and it's, it was brilliant. It was on Disney Channel, but the, the point is it had a run. They didn't pick it up because they don't own the merchandising. Oh, you got to be kidding me. No. I won't get into that can of worms. That- no, no. But that broke my heart because sure. I loved doing him. Oh, he wow. was so different. I mean, even though he was exhausting to do for, for, for three hours or four hours, but, you know, it was just wonderful. That's great. That's beautiful that you got to represent such a important because these characters are important. You know, they really they touch oh God, people. Of course they are. See, that was one of the things about getting involved in social media and having somebody. I did not realize how the characters I've done over the years have impacted people. There's something about that's a well, gift when it's no, yeah, it is when it's no longer coming out of a human face. There is something that tears down our inner walls where now that voice, we allow them to enter our lives in a way that is quicker than any other way, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I've gotten letters. I got one about Izzy. And this was somebody who had attention deficit disorder. And I guess watching Izzy from, watching Izzy from um, (laughs) Digimon. Oh, hello. okay. Izzy from Digimon. Digital Monster. Yeah. The computer genius, which is so far away from me in real life, but not his personality. And also, I have to tell you, I came up with the word prodigious. I'll tell you, that's a very cute story. Anyway, she related to that because he was a computer wizard. And that was where she found solace, was in working on the computer. Oh. I got that letter and was like, oh my God. That's great. One of the things I loved about touring with the LA Moving Van and Puppet Company and why I still read to children today oh. as a volunteer both at Descanso Gardens and then um, at base camp once a month is because I miss that interaction with kids and I don't have any of my own. So, you know, and plus they'd be grown by now. Oh, but but you you, do, Mona. You have children all over the world. (laughs) You think about it. I I feel very blessed. And especially since I don't have to pay for their college educations. (laughs) Exactly. You have grandchildren all over the world. because Yes, I do. All right, stop right there, young man. Just joking. (laughs) Um, 
But the prodigious story is funny. We had our first session of, Digi of Digimon. Yes, I do know the series. It's Digimon. Anyway, um, <laughs> and we were looking for some kind of word. Now, you understand it can't go too far afield because it's, you know, it's anime. So you have to think in terms of sinking. That weekend, my husband and I watched October Sky. Do you know the film? I do. Okay. There is one point where the redheaded guy, not the lead, the redheaded guy, the rocket is launched and he mispronounces it. He says, prodigious. And it's prodigious. And I came back and said to the producer, Terry Lee, I said, I have his word. Prodigious. Nice. You never know yeah, where that's no, really good. That's awesome. I still use it on the new Digimon. Too. Oh, look at that. Oh, how cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very cool. It's very cool. I like it. <laughs> I was hoping you would indulge me one final request here. Sure. For a long time now, you've been the voice of Publix, right? Oh, Absolutely. Only at Publix, where shopping is a pleasure. What is it that you'd like me to say? This is not an actual animated series, but in my imagination, I like to pretend that there is an animated series based on the 79 film Alien with Sigourney Weaver. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Which is 40 years old right now. It's celebrating its 40th anniversary. And so in that film, the ship's computer is known as Mother. And I thought, how cool oh, yeah. would it be to hear Mother as the public's voice? <laughs> Danger, the emergency destruct system is now activated. The ship will detonate in T minus 10 minutes. The option to override automatic detonation expires in T minus five minutes. Ooh, it's creepy. I love it. <laughs> Delightfully creepy, though. Yeah, exactly. That's, I think the best thing about a science fiction computer voice is when it sounds pleasant. Yes. You know who... Um, I think in the back of my mind, I was thinking of, oh, Dave. Yes. You mean Hal, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, all the yes, best. but how I get, you know, they're, they're like lines, key lines, I call them. Mm. You know, for Kyle's mom, it's, what, what, what? I had no idea chicken pox was such a dangerous idea. Because that's what I heard over and over again. And then for Butter's mom, it's, paint, more paint. It's the line that gets you into it. For Dry Mom, it's, oh, that's weird. That's really weird. Um, <laughs> It's like their signature line. It's like what they're known for, right? What they're known for and what gets you into that. Thank you, Mona, so much for being here today. You've, You're welcome. You've uh, really uh, made me feel special with your time and uh, all your expertise, obviously. And when can we expect to see Puss and Dick? Well, it all depends on uh, two things. <laughs> I have to get an animator. I think I can do most of the storyboards. I'm hoping by the end of this year. Great. I mean, keep me in the loop so I can let everybody... I will keep you in the loop. Everyone who has been kind enough to want to interview me, I will keep in the loop. Believe me. Great. Yasmin is really great at what she does. I will make sure that everybody <laughs> who is in touch with me knows. Plus, if you check social media, because we're trying to keep, you know, while we're developing this, we're trying to also direct people to the comic, even though the comic is not ongoing. It at least gives them an idea of the characters. Where can we see the comic? Adventuresofpussanddick.com. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The comic is fun. And Ani's illustrations are just wonderful. Yes. Well, thanks again for being here, Mona. This has been fantastic. Well, thank you for having me. I have had a great time. You are a wonderful person to talk with. As are very you. Very good interviewer. Oh, well, thank you. I practice. You bring out the best in people. I should learn to actually. Who was interrupting who? Never mind. I had a great time. It's been marvelous. God bless. Take care. Good luck with your project. You too, Mona. Bye. Bye-bye. All righty, that's it for this episode. Special thanks go out once again to Mona Marshall for joining us here on the show. And as always, thank you so much for listening in at home. Want to get more Stay Tuned? Simply visit patreon.com forward slash philmaki. Subscribing there will get you access to cool rewards like exclusive interview outtakes, my cartoon reviews, and monthly video updates. Did you know I'm also a cartoonist? Check out my original comic books at RetailSunshine.com. You can even reach out to me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook under the handles of both Retail Sunshine and Phil Maki. And consider this your personal invitation to join the amazing Stay Tuned community on Facebook. Visit facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Stay Tuners. 
I've been Phil Maki, you've been a wonderful audience, and until next time, keep those eyeballs peeled, those ears open, and be sure to stay tuned.